Good morning. So y'all can see I'm on the wrong side this morning because our call to worship is going to be with the piano. I have a verse that I'm excited to share with you this morning. When I usually pick a verse for the week, I do a lot of praying about it before I put it up there. This one, I just knew it in my heart. This was the right one. I think my spirit did cartwheels when I read this for Palm Sunday, and I was just thinking, this is it. So it comes from the book of Hebrews, chapter 9, verse 28. So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Are you eagerly waiting for him? Because I am. I am so excited. I thought this week, and I, I do this each Easter, I try to put myself in, in a mindset where what was it like? What was it like to be there, to see Jesus enter the city and his triumphal entry? How awesome that would be to be a part of his ministry. But then I immediately go to how hard would it be to see our Savior on that cross? Because we try to, to feel that. He sacrificed himself, but unless you were there, I don't think you could get the full experience. And I'm kind of glad I didn't because I don't think I could handle it. But we were destined for this point in time. God created us. Perfect timing to be right now in a time when we are waiting for his second coming. And there's a good chance that every single one of us in this room will get to experience it or at least some of us, and I'm looking forward to it. This morning, stand with me. We're going to sing our praise and work, our call to worship. We're going to sing Hosanna, loud Hosanna, and celebrate Jesus' triumphal entry into the city. go before the Lord in prayer. Father, we just thank you, Lord, once again for uh, being with us. We thank you, Lord, for this special time of the year uh, when we can sense your presence, Lord, when we can remember uh, the suffering that you had to go through, Lord, in order to rescue us from sin, from Satan, and even from death itself. And we thank you, Father God, uh, that this was a very, very special date in the history of the nation of Israel, as well as in your prophetic calendar, Lord, for the world. And as we celebrate, Lord, Palm Sunday, we pray that uh, you would open our hearts and our minds, Lord, to receive what you have to say to us today. And so, Father, we ask your blessing on our time together. We invite the presence of your Holy Spirit in our midst, and we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. amen. You may be seated. Well, um, I want to welcome everybody here this morning, especially all of you who are here uh, during you know, our morning service face-to-face, uh, -face. also the folks that are tuning in with us on Channel 13 this morning, and those who are either watching on YouTube or will be watching sometime in the, uh, in the future. And uh, last week I mentioned that uh, there had been some sightings of uh, Ronnie Daughtry, uh, both at the Seniors uh, Center as well as the... Um, uh, on Sunday evening and also at Carly C's. And so I just wanted to uh, show proof that I was not telling you a fib. 
<laughs> and uh, so I've asked Ronnie to come up and uh, just share. I know he, he's, you know, very grateful for our prayers, our uh, call, our concern, our visits, and so on and so forth. And uh, we, we love Ronnie. Um, you know, we were in shock when, um, uh, you know, he went through this ordeal with his heart and so forth. And so I want to give him an opportunity to just uh, share from his heart this morning. Okay. I like to uh, first give God credit because I almost died in Chapel Hill. And uh, for some reason, he saved me. But my family was told to do last words, so my whole family was there and told me goodbye. So that's got to be weird, you know. <laughs> they sent me home. They told me I had 10 days to live. My heart was very weak. So they sent me home on hospice. And uh, they are wonderful people, but my wife and daughter said, you know, there's probably an alternative to this. So they started looking for a doctor. i make a long story short. Um, my daughter is friends with Norman um, in uh, Greenville, whose best friend was a doctor. I taught Norman in school. He coached my grandkids, and he said that... Uh, <clears throat> that David was a good friend, and he could get me an appointment. So I met with him, and he said, I can help you. Uh, I've looked at your records, and I, I can help you. The problem is i got about two months of people ahead of you. And um, he said, but you won't live that long. I said, so what are we going to do? He said, well, I'm going to bump you up. I said, well, what does that mean? He said, can you be here Thursday at 6? And I said, you mean in the morning? <laughs> he said, yeah, we do stuff early here. Well, I went next Thursday. They took me at 9.30, okay? So they didn't do it real early. But uh, I want to thank Dr. Frazier, uh, my family, for, uh, for Norman for finding him. Uh, he was wonderful. He... Uh, he did a three and a half procedure, hour procedure, which gave me uh, this device that's inside of me uh, called a defibrillator. Uh, <clears throat> and it does all kinds of wonderful things. Um, but uh, when I was talking to him, he said, I like to talk to my patients. He said, I found that patients that, that have uh, great faith do better. He said, how is your faith? I said, I'm a Baptist. I'm a deacon, I'm a Gideon. So does that answer your question? I have great faith. And uh, after the procedure, he came to visit. It was midnight. He said he had been real busy, uh, but he said everything went well, and tomorrow we're going to do part two, which is an ablation. And he said, then you will probably be in good shape. So, yeah, I have been in good shape ever since. And... Um, now, I want to thank a few people here. Um, uh, John has been with me all the way. My deacon, Carrie Livesey, was with me at all three hospitals. I was in the hospital for 20 days in three different places at four different times. Um, I've, I've discovered a couple of things. Food is bad in a lot of places. The only thing I could eat in Chapel Hill was yogurt, pretzels, and ginger ale. Greenville has great meals. They have things like pot roast, stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but when, uh, <clears throat> when I think about all the people here, I think about uh, David and Tommy taking over from my Sunday school class. And I do plan to return to Sunday school. Maybe David and I can, can alternate. Um, I want to thank Kenny for bringing groceries. I think if I mention Carly C, they'll be free. No, not, nah, okay. <laughs> well, that was a try, anyway. Um, but it's nice when somebody brings groceries right to your house. You know. I want to thank, um, I don't know who, who had the idea of the meal train. Geneva, was it you? Francis. Okay, it was wonderful. Two weeks of good food, and who knew Robert Newton could cook? I mean, chicken pot pie and uh, brownies, that was great. I want to thank uh, all of you for your visits at the hospital, for your notes, 
letters. Um, I think I must have got a letter or card from everybody in this church. And if, but if you didn't write one, uh, there's still time. And uh, <laughs> I'm still going to be here for a while. Um, so, um, yeah, we got some good cooks in this church, uh, good food. I want to tell you three kind of funny things that happened, and I'll close. They were trying to, uh, I was talking to Cash Shaw. Cash Shaw went to see David Frazier 11 years ago, got a pacemaker. And he was, uh, he was asking me, you know, you know, what did I have? And I said, well, I've got something better than you did. I said, if the pacemaker went to college, got a PhD, it would be a defibrillator, and that's what I've got right here. Uh, I don't think he liked that very much, but uh, anyway. <laughs> but he's had it 11 years, so that tells you uh, that it's working. But I went to my doctor. We were having a discussion, and I said, I don't really understand how this stuff works. I got a monitor, and something goes wrong, and you're in Greenville, I'm in Tarboro, and you can fix me up. He said, yeah, yeah, that's right. He said, if your, if your heart got out of rhythm and we had to shock you, we could do that from Greenville. And I said, well, would it hurt? He said, it would get your attention. <laughs> Did I mention I have a very funny doctor? And then the last thing, <clears throat> um, you know, um, it's like uh, our, my friends had AFib. I heard them talking about it for years. To me, it was no big deal. So I have AFib. I go to, to the hospital, almost die. First time I've ever been to a hospital that I was sick. I mean, I couldn't understand it. So I said to my doctor, I said, they have these watches, uh, these Apple watches, it costs $300, and it tells them when they have AFib. I said, do I need one of those? He said, look, it tells them they're in AFib, it does nothing. He said, you got a device that not only tells you what's going on, it fixes it. And it will do that for the rest of your life. And I said, well, those watches are $300. He said, your device was $30,000. <laughs> That's the end of the story. Uh, keep praying for me, okay? All right. Amen. Ronnie is a miracle, and he's an answer to prayer. Amen. Um, Ronnie, um, as he was going through this trial, started giving away all of his pocket knives. He's got a vast collection of knives and rocks. He was a science teacher. And so uh, I just forewarned all of you men who have received one of these gifts uh, that Ronnie may want him back. Uh, <laughs> I already told Ronnie he cannot have mine back, so, uh, but anyway, it's, it's good to have Ronnie here, and uh, also Frances, you know, she's in the background, she's the one, the main caregiver, um, uh, Grand Central Station when it comes to phone calls and texts and all of those things, um, and so, um, you know, we're very grateful that God, you know, brought them together, and they're still together, amen, amen. Um, just a few quick announcements. Uh, Vacation Bible School will be June 17th through the 19th uh, from 9 to 12. Also this Thursday, we have Monday Thursday, which is the um, institution of the Lord's Supper. And so we have a service here every year at 7 o'clock at night where we do have the Lord's Supper. It's a shorter service. And then on Easter Sunday, we have a sunrise service at 8 o'clock in the morning out here in the Common where we sing a couple of hymns, we read some scripture, we, we pray. Uh, we have a number of folks in the community that sometimes will come and uh, partake with us. And then right after that at 8.30, we have a breakfast downstairs. Uh, Geneva and her, her team uh, prepare uh, breakfast for us. And then we'll have our regular service, our Sunday school at 9.15, our service at 10.30. Sunday night, we will not have a service on Easter Sunday since we have a lot of family that come in and, you know, special meals and lunches and so forth. Also, uh, this Wednesday night, we do not have a service since we're going to be having our Monday, uh, Thursday uh, service. But we do have a choir practice at 7 o'clock. 
Tonight we have uh, the book of Revelation. Again, uh, at 6 o'clock, we're going to be looking at the Church of Philadelphia and the Church of Laodicea. And I uh, wanted to do uh, two more things. We have some sermon notes, uh, little notebooks here for, for the men. Now, these are nice, but compared to the ones the ladies got, they're ugly, okay? Now, us guys, we don't care, right? Generally speaking. Um, so, we ran out of the women's notebooks. I ordered another 15. Uh, they'll be in this week, so on Easter Sunday, we'll be able to pass those out for you ladies who did not get a chance to get one. Or if you have a friend or someone from the church that is not able to attend, you want to take that to them, you can do that. And then finally, I just wanted to share um, the uh, pastor at uh, Trinity Baptist uh, Trinity Church uh, right here on West Wilson uh, basically dropped out a couple of flyers, one announcing that they're having a Christian Seder service this Thursday night at 6 o'clock, and it's basically a, the Passover meal connected to the Lord's Supper. And also, uh, they are having what they call um, the Stations of the Cross, and that uh, basically is a commemoration of the last day Jesus was on earth, and there are 14 different stations that are illustrated, and that will take place on April the 7th. If you've ever heard of the Stations of the Cross, that is a something that the Roman Catholic Church does. I came out of the Roman Catholic Church, so I know... Uh, what that means, and um, so I don't know how they're going to, you know, make those connections there, but I uh, just wanted to share that with you all. Uh, and then finally, the flowers that we have in the sanctuary today were given by Mary Lou and Glenn Scott on the anniversary of the death of her father, Raymond O'Neill, and in memory of his father, Brian Scott, on his birthday. All right, we're going into our, our time of prayer. to read a uh, testimony, a gospel transformation story from our book, Loving the Lost Through Prayer, the 21st edition that our International Mission Board uh, puts out. The Pesisir lore of Indonesia, uh, Joel 2.13 says, and rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and he relents over disasters. Yolanda comes from an unreached people group, the Pesisir Lor in Indonesia. She heard the gospel, embraced faith in Jesus, and regularly attended church. But after a series of tragedies, she abandoned God. One day, she heard a believer proclaiming the gospel in a park and was captivated once again by the message. Yolanda returned to her home village and began spreading the gospel a house church started, and her own family came to faith. We thank God for sustaining Yolanda as she faithfully persisted in bringing the gospel to the Pesisir Lord people despite enduring persecution. Also, we want to pray for the Bondo of India today. In John 4:14, 4, it says, But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never thir be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The Bondo people live in the hills of Odisha in eastern India. This isolated tribe faces malnutrition, unclean water, lack of medical care, and excessive consumption of their home-brewed alcohol. Illiteracy is high among the Bondo, which limits their access to education and jobs for income. 
They mix animism, which is the worship of spirits, into their Hindu rituals. The Bandal live in darkness, separated from God, with little to no access to the good news. And so we're praying today for the Pesisir lore of Indonesia and also for the Bando of India to hear the good news, to believe, to be transformed, to live in the light of the gospel. Uh, also wanted to mention that um, I had a chance to visit with Marguerite Holland yesterday, and uh, we want to pray for her. Uh, you know, she's either 100 or 101 years of age, um, and so she feels that she may not have much longer on, on this earth. And so um, I went and talked with her, prayed with her, and so we want to hold her up in prayers, uh, you know, in our prayers uh, for the next several days, okay? Uh, so we're going to be praying for the Bondo and uh, for Marguerite and any other prayer requests that you may have, uh, just mention that out loud and we will join you in prayer. Father, we come before you, Lord, again uh, this morning. Father, we are, we are family, Lord. We are the family of God. We are the body of Christ. And Father, your word says that when one member of the body hurts, that the whole body hurts as well. And so, Father, we want to pray for Marguerite this morning, Lord. We know that uh, your word says that our days are numbered. They're all written in your book. And so we pray, Lord, for Marguerite over the next several days. Uh, we don't know for sure, Lord, what the future holds uh, or how many more days, Lord, you have given her. But we pray, Lord, that you would give her strength, give her grace. And Father, uh, may your presence, Lord, fill her heart. We also pray for the Bondo, Lord, of India and the Pesasir, Lord, of Indonesia. Father, we pray that the gospel, Lord, would shine brightly, that it would break through the darkness, Lord, that it would transform the lives of both of these people groups and their culture, their society, their faith, Lord, and their entire lives for your glory in Jesus' name. Our president and vice president. Donnell. Father, thank you, Lord, once again. Lord, your word says that your house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. And we know, Lord God, that we can come into your presence, Lord, to your throne of grace, through the new and living way, Lord, the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, the perfect sacrifice given once and for all, Lord, for the sins of the world and for those who believe in you. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Let's stand as we sing our offertory hymn, hymn 237, I Stand Amazed in the Presence.
Let us pray. Father, we come into your house today with joy and thanksgiving, bringing our offerings to be blessed and used for your will and your glory here on earth. Father, we pray that you will bless the giver and the money and that you will use us to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. of you could imagine even thinking about sacrificing your child for anything anything at all we worry about our kids on a daily basis don't we doesn't matter how old they are we pray for their safety but there's always that chance that something could happen but God knew what was going to happen and he sacrificed his son for us but on the other side of that he also knew that this was required. This had to happen. The powers of hell are defeated because God loved us so much that he gave his son. Stand with us this morning. We're going to sing God so loved the world this morning. Let's sing out his praises that he was willing to do that for us. Lowly as we are, he loves us.
praise this morning.
Amen. That was wonderful. You know that we will all be in God's heavenly choir one day. We'll be in the presence of the Lord. As a matter of fact, uh, praising God and worshiping God brings the presence of God uh, in our midst. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, Paul said, there is liberty. Amen. Let's stand to our feet this morning as we read from Luke chapter 19, uh, verses 28 through 44, and I'm reading from the New International Version, and this is the account of the triumphal entry of Jesus into the city of Jerusalem, coming in from the Mount of Olives, uh, which took place in the month of April of the year 32 A.D., After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? Tell him, The Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owner asked them, Why are you untying the colt? And they replied, The Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down to the Mount of Olives, The whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, He wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you, Father, for your word. We thank you, Lord God, that uh, everything that you had in your prophetic calendar and everything that you had in mind, Lord, was fulfilled that week in the triumphal entry of your son, Jesus Christ, as one of the major signs, Lord, to the people of Israel, to the nation of Israel, to the leaders, the spiritual leaders of that, of that nation, uh, that you are indeed, Lord, the Messiah, the Son of David, the King of Israel, and the Messiah, Lord, and the Savior of the world. And Father, we pray now that as we look into your word, as we glean, as we uh, consider even the times that we are living in and consider and look to- forward to your soon return, Lord, the next coming, your second coming, Father, that you would speak to our hearts, that you would encourage us, Lord, that you would convict us, Father, in the areas that we need to be convicted in, and, Father, that we would turn our hearts to you, that we would be devoted to you, Father, during this time in history, and we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You may be seated. This morning, I want to focus on the last few verses where the Lord weeps over the city of Jerusalem because they did not recognize the time of God's coming to them. And as we see at the end of this uh, passage of Scripture, we see God's impending judgment for rejecting the coming of the King of Israel after the triumphal entry, which was a sign of the coming of the King, of the Messiah of the Jews. The triumphal entry is found in all four Gospels, in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 11, Luke, uh, chapter 19, the chapter of John, chapter 12, and also in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 21. 
As a matter of fact, in the Gospel of Matthew, uh, it addresses the city of Jerusalem as the daughter of Zion. And uh, it says, See, your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. That is the fulfillment of Zechariah chapter 9, verses 9 and 10, which was also a prophetic sign of the coming of the Messiah. And we see that there were large crowds in verse 8 that would spread their cloaks on the road while others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them also on the road. And they were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. Well, this is a special week for the church and for Christendom all over the world. Uh, it, um, it's a time of preparation, a time of prayer and fasting as we come closer and closer to the death of Christ. And then we commemorate on Easter Sunday the resurrection of our Lord and our Savior three days after he had been placed in the tomb. As we look at this passage, I just wanted to point out before I go into the, the, the main part of the message that Jerusalem was the city where God over centuries had sent his prophets time and time and time again to call the people of God to repentance. And now he finally sends his son. And this is also the city where the prophets were persecuted, where they were rejected, and they were killed. The village uh, of Bethphage was a village that was close to Bethany and the Mount of Olives. And Bethany is the place where Lazarus and his sisters lived. And just a few days earlier, the Lord had raised Lazarus from the dead. And that was the nail in the coffin, so to speak, as far as the Jewish leaders was concerned. And where they were now specifically planning on killing not only Jesus, but also killing Lazarus. The Mount of Olives, as we look at the history of the Mount of Olives and we look at this, what is mentioned in the Gospels, we know that this is where the Garden of Gethsemane was located, where Jesus was betrayed by Judas Iscariot, uh, when Jesus was sent to be tried and sentenced illegally, by the way, and also where Jesus would come to pray often with his disciples. This is where Jesus ascended into heaven and from where he will also once again return and this is where, if you have had a chance and the privilege of visiting the city of Jer uh, the nation of Israel, this is where you also have a really nice look of the city of Jerusalem, the Jewish temple, as well as the eastern gate, uh, where the future king and the son of David will enter to take his throne. When they sing Hosanna in the highest, it's referring to the heavens, the dwelling place of the Lord God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and is also where Jesus had come, he had come from heaven in his first coming as the Lord's messenger. Zion is the mountain of God, the mountain where Abraham had sacrificed Isaac, and the mountain where Jerusalem is located, the city of the King of David, which he took from the Jebusites, and also Zion is where the political seat of government as well as the royal palace and the spiritual seat that is the temple are located and were located at that time in Jerusalem. So I believe that we can uh, look at six takeaways as I look at this passage of scripture, as I consider the times that we live in today, as we look forward to the second coming of Christ, as we see what took place during the first coming of the Lord, and as the Lord made his triumphal entry and he came into the city of Jerusalem as he was coming down from the Mount of Olives, and we see the response of the people as they worshiped the king, as they welcomed the king, as they rejoiced joyfully. Many of the disciples laying their cloaks on the, on the ground as well as the, the, the palm branches. And the first thing that I believe that we can see here uh, is that it is a matter of utmost importance to be prepared for the coming of the king. The nation of Israel was not prepared for his first coming. In Daniel chapter 9, we see the prophecy that was given to Daniel of the 70 weeks of Daniel. And uh, I mentioned in the article that I wrote for the trumpet that that day of the triumphal entry took place on April the 6th of A.D. 32, which is the 10th of the month Nisan in the Jewish calendar. It was Sir Robert Anderson, the former chief of the Criminal Investigation Department of Scotland Yard in London, 
who crunched the numbers, and there's a little more detail there in the Trumpet article, as to the exact date when the Messiah made his entry as the king of Israel uh, on the day of the triumphal entry. And so the nation of Israel did not uh, recognize the coming of the Messiah. And also the fact that he came in riding on the colt of a donkey in a humble manner as a triumphant king, as a king coming to take his throne, the throne of David, was a clear sign that was prophesied in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. The fact is that they did not recognize him. As a matter of fact, John in the gospel, first chapter of John and verses 11 and 12, John says that he came to his own and his own did not receive him, but to all who received him, he gave the right to become sons of God, that is to those who believe in his name. Many of us here today have received him, even though we did not live during the days that the Lord came. We did not live here during the days of his earthly ministry. We did not see the great miracles that they were rejoicing over as the, Jesus was coming into the city of Jerusalem. And we also know that they did not understand the parables and the teachings of Jesus, nor did they believe his signs and his miracles. As a matter of fact, in Isaiah, it was prophesied that the Lord spoke to them in, in parables so that even though they saw, they would not uh, clearly understand. And even though they would hear, they would not understand what, what the Lord was speaking to them. They did not believe the testimony of God the Father, of John the Baptist, of the disciples, and even of the apostles. Neither did they believe the testimony of Moses and the prophets. In Luke chapter 16, verse 31, we have the story of Lazarus and the rich man. And in the interchange between um, uh, Abraham um, and the, the rich man, he says, but Abraham said to him, if you do not listen to Moses and the prophets, you will not be persuaded if anyone rises from the dead. So a matter of utmost importance for us believers and Christians today is that we need to be prepared for the second coming of Christ. And part of this preparation has to do with living in holiness before the Lord, before our families, our neighbors, in order to bring glory to the king and not to put a stumbling block before anyone who does not know the Lord. The second takeaway that I believe we can see here is that it is a matter of utmost urgency to share the message of salvation with the world. This represents the, to be obedient to the King's Great Commission, which is found in Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20, which we all know it well. And when the Lord comes at his second coming, he is not coming to save the world, but he is coming to judge the world. He will come to bring condemnation and not salvation. It will be to bring vengeance and not forgiveness. And that is why as believers, this is a matter of utmost importance. If we love our friends, our neighbors, if we care for a lost world that does not know Christ, because the Lord is coming, and He's coming soon, and He's coming not to save, but to judge. In an expository commentary on the Gospel of Mark, uh, Dr. Danny Aiken, and I believe I read this uh, last year or have read it in the past, uh, Danny Aiken makes a comparison between the first coming of Christ and the second coming of Christ. And I'm going to go back and forth. In the first coming, He came to die. He will come to reign. He came in a, on a little donkey. He will come on a war horse. He came as a humble servant. He will come as an exalted king. He came in weakness. He will come in great power. He came to save. He will come to judge. He came in love. He is coming in wrath. He came as veiled deity. He will come as deity revealed. He came with 12 disciples. He will come with an army of angels. He came to bring peace. He's coming to make war. He gave, they gave him a crown of thorns. They will give him a royal crown. He came as a suffering servant. He will come as King of kings and Lord of lords. We specifically need to share the gospel with our friends, our neighbors, our family. We also need to budget in our monies, in our monthly income, 
monies that will go to advance the kingdom of God through church planning, through national and international missionaries. And this needs to be a priority for believers, especially as we draw closer and closer to the return of the Lord. Also, we need to spend times in prayer. And I know many of us here are praying for revival, are praying for a move of God as we see the things that are taking place in our country that are taking place also in many parts of the world. And you've heard the news of what just took place in, in Moscow. Um, and so we need to have times of prayer for our missionaries, for pastors, for servants and Christian leaders, as well as local and international ministries and especially for those that do not yet know the Lord through his son, Jesus Christ. I believe the third takeaway is that a topic of great relevance is to know the times in which we are living today. God has a calendar of events that anticipate the second coming of the king. There have been many Bible teachers, many uh, college professors, many ministries, particularly in the last 50 years or so since the 1960s that have really, really come out with a lot of uh, teachings and interpretations and have laid out in, a very, in very clear ways and through many, many different ways the prophetic calendar that God has before the return of Christ. And the nation of Israel plays a role as the epicenter of divine activity before the coming of the Lord. This May 14th, um, will mark the 76th anniversary of the return of the nation of Israel to the land. And we know from history, and we know even from what's going on today in the world, that all of the activity in the Middle East is surrounded, is, is around the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel has been at war since the very day in which it was established and recognized as a state by the United Nations, by President Truman, one of the first to recognize the United States to uh, make that public recognition of the nation of Israel and their sovereignty, their right to exist, their right to the land, a land that God gave to them, uh, and also uh, to Abraham, to Isaac, Jacob, and to his descendants. And so there's a prophetic calendar that involves the return of Christ uh, through the rapture, the first uh, resurrection, the appearing of the Antichrist, the seven-year treaty that he will broker with the nation of Israel and the nations of the world, where he will guarantee peace for the nation of Israel. And we can see how things are moving in that direction. Uh, there will be seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls of judgment. It'll be the time of the Great Tribulation, which is the time of Jacob's trouble, a time in which there will be another Jewish holocaust, and I believe the book of Revelation speaks two-thirds of the Jewish people will once again die before the Lord returns in glory. And then the second coming of Christ will take place, uh, the millennium, then the second resurrection, and then the great white throne judgment before uh, eternity is ushered in. And so this is one of the reasons why we're doing a study on the book of Revelation on Sunday evenings. Uh, this is something that God has impressed upon me as, as a pastor. Um, a number of years ago, I was uh, studying uh, the area of not-for-profit uh, organizations. And one thing that stuck with me in a book called uh, Not-for-Profit not Organizations written by Peter Drucker. Peter Drucker was a guru, a business uh, man and a business guru back in the day. Uh, and this is back in the 90s when IBM would hire him to come for a day and kind of give him some advice. They paid him $10,000. You know, that was the type of man that he was. But one of the things that Peter Drucker said in his book was that one of the key roles of a leader is to anticipate the future. And so this is one of the things that I can see, and I believe many people in the church today, many pastors uh, many prophecy experts and so on and so forth are anticipating that we are uh, at the door of the return of Christ uh, to this world. The fourth thing that I believe we can see here is that it's a work of intentional diligence to occupy until he comes. Uh, folks, as the church in America, we do very, very little evangelism. Uh, we do very, very little of sharing of our faith, of leading other people to the Lord. 
And this is, has to be one of the main occupations of each and every one of us as believers uh, of the church in the area of evangelism, discipleship, church planning, pastoral care of God's flock, and being occupied in the service and the ministry of the family of God in the local church. We need to give God and we need to give His church first priority and first importance in our lives, in our weekly calendars, in our families, uh, and not allow school calendars and other activities, going to the beach every single weekend, uh, and many other things that take our attention and take us away from, from the Lord, especially in the times in which we live. The fifth thing that I believe is a takeaway also is the, a reality that is coming very, very soon, and that is we need to be prepared for persecution. This is another thing that I believe that uh, many uh, Christian leaders are experiencing, and even people in the marketplace who believe in Christ, uh, uh, things that they said or shared on Facebook or comments that they made or uh, conferences that they attended. Uh, even recently, my understanding is that our government is uh, flagging uh, the purchases of Bibles and the purchases at places like Cabela's and Dick's Sporting Goods stores and so on and so forth, particularly in the area of, of guns and ammunition. And um, so we are seeing an increasing uh, surveillance state uh, taking place here in our nation. And Jesus, just like he was persecuted and he indicated to us that his disciples would also be persecuted in prison and even killed. And there's a number of passages here that I will not share because of time. But in Luke chapter 21, verses 10 through 19, there are a number of signs and things that are taking place and will take place before the return of Christ. And also Matthew 24, uh, in the gospel of Matthew chapter 24, there's a number of things. And that chapter deals specifically with those seven years of uh, before the return of Christ. And this uh, and so there's going to be a cost to us to be disciples. Uh, part of that cost will be paid by living holy and godly lives. And believe me, we are bombarded today uh, for our time, for our energy, for our finances, uh, to indulge in a number of different uh, pleasures and so on and so forth. And part of this is also going to be paid by self-sacrifice and self-control as we make daily decisions as to uh, where are we going to put our money, about our families, our jobs, and the world that we live in. Uh, we, the losing of our jobs, our families, our friends, our freedom, our physical lives, uh, even um, in the midst of a, an increasing cancel culture in our country. And I don't know if uh, you heard or saw in the news that recently uh, the nation of France has included abortion in their constitution. And so these types of things are coming uh, to our country. Uh, that is going to basically uh, try to silence the church, silence uh, conservative Americans who do not believe that aborting a child is a human right by any means. And then finally, the sixth takeaway that I believe that we see here is that Jesus Christ is the soon coming king. And so the question is, are you ready? Are you ready? Am I ready? Are we all ready for the return of, the Christ, of Christ? The Bible tells us that he is going to rule over the nations. In Daniel 7, verses 13 and 14, it says, His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will never pass away, and his kingdom, one that will not be destroyed. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, For he must reign until it has, he has put all of his enemies under his feet. In Philippians chapter 2, it says, Wherefore God has also exalted him to the highest place and bestowed upon him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord for the glory of God the Father. In Revelation 17, it says, These will fight against the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them, for He is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those who are with Him are called, chosen, and faithful. And so, as we close this morning, we see that it is a matter of great importance for us as believers to be prepared for the coming of the King. 
It is a matter of utmost urgency to share the message of salvation with those who do not know the Lord. It is a topic of great relevance to know the times that we are living in, and it is also a work that we need to be engaged in intentionally to be busy and to occupy until the Lord returns. And also we see the reality that is coming, which is persecution, and especially that the Lord is the coming King. And so the question that I believe each and every one of us needs to answer today is, are we ready for the Lord to return? So let's stand as we get ready to sing our hymn of invitation. And that's hymn 101. We're going to be singing the first and the third verses. And I believe that we need to be sure, the Apostle Paul said, that we need to be sure that we are in the faith. And I know there are many folks that have been attending church year after year. Maybe you were brought up, you were raised in the church. Um, and there are folks that are watching today as well that uh, may believe that they are Christians, but you still are not 100% sure that if you were to die today that you would go to heaven, that you would go into the presence of God. And so I, I want to encourage you uh, to make sure in your own heart, in your own life, in your own mind, whether you want to come talk to me sometime later on in the week or in the weeks to come, or you want to go home or right there where you are today, uh, get on your knees and make sure that you know Jesus before he returns. So let's stand as we sing our hymn of invitation. And if there's anybody here that would need prayer for any reason, um, we'll be glad to, be, to pray for you. Thank you, Lord, once again for your Son, our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Son of David, the Messiah King of Israel. And Father, what we have spoken of and shared today, Lord, is our, our realities, their truths. Uh, there are things, Lord, that we need to bear in mind as we draw closer and closer to the return of your Son, Jesus Christ as we see the increased antagonism, not only against the people of Israel, Lord, but also against the church, against Christians, and not just pastors or Christian leaders, Lord, but also Christians in the marketplace and in every walk of life. And so we pray, Father, that once again, that you would place upon our hearts uh, the urgency of the hour, uh, the urgency of the need to pray, to intercede for, first of all, for our loved ones, our families, our friends, Lord, our neighbors. And Father, I pray, Lord, also that you would increase the opportunities, Lord, that we would have to be able to share our faith with other people, that we would be able to pray for them, that we would be able to lead him to the throne of grace, to the throne of mercy, while there's still time. And Father, I pray now that you would bless your people, uh, that you would continue to be with us, that you would give us your grace, and Lord, that we would live day to day for your glory and we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you and hug somebody's neck before you leave.